bitter sweet tale of dihydrocalcalcones in apple dr ross atkinson is a principal scientist at the new zealand institute of plant and food research limited dr atkinson research is focused on understanding flavors and textures in fruit as a translational research the knowledge gained from his research is commercialized through plant breeding industrial biotechnology applications by biofermentation of flowers and fragrances and development of fruit essences uh, many more can be said about him but i think i will stop here and listen to we'll, we all will listen to it his lecture before that before that let me welcome all the speakers all the speakers uh, york dr sanjay kumar myself and dr tulsi ram to this session and all the participants and all the all the researchers students scientists and everybody to this session uh, welcome and uh, ross please you can okay can you see my screen yes okay excellent i'm just trying to get my talk up on this end which is proving a little bit tricky okay there we go i've got it on my end oh thank you very much for that uh kind introduction and thanks uh, Dinesh for inviting me to talk. Uh, coming from New Zealand, attending uh, conferences always involves traveling really long distances, so it's quite nice to present a conference uh, without suffering uh, from jet lag. So, oops, is that actually Moving down through the, no, can't seem to. Are the slides moving or not? No, it's not moving. Okay, not quite sure why that is. Slides are not moving, sir. Yeah. Maybe he needs to rejoin. Okay, I will rejoin. Now it's moving. to hear me maybe I should start from the beginning and so thanks again to Dinesh for inviting me uh, to, to, to come along 
Uh, I'm from Plant and Food Research, and uh, we're interested in breeding high value um, fruit varieties. And we do this by breeding what the consumer wants. So this slide shows what the consumer wants when they buy food. They want things that are convenient, things like a banana, which can be peeled. They want fruit that is really flavorful and tasty. And of course, they want fruit that is healthy and good for them. With apples, consumers recognize uh, that fruit is, is, health, is healthy for them. And there's a, a well-known saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So people know that, uh, that apples are good for them. So breeding targets for um, apple health include things like uh, dietary fiber for a healthy digestive tract, things like pectin to regulate the gut microbiome. You could breed for vitamins and minerals for healthy teeth. There's also um, a lot of antioxidants um, in apples, things like anthocyanins and quercetin and chlorogenic acid. And these are known to be good for heart health. Uh, they can lower blood pressure and reduce the risk of strokes. But the compounds I'm interested in are uh, dihydrochalcones, uh, and these include compounds like fluoritin and fluorazin. And these accumulate to very high levels in the leaves and bark of the, of the apple tree, but they're also a major compound in fruit skin. What makes um, the particularly interesting target is they're not found in pear, which is the closest relative to apple or any of the other rosaceae. So why are we interested in targeting fluoritin and fluorazin? Well, they've been, fluoritin has been identified as a possible anti-obesity agent, and it has a long history of pharmacological use um, as it blocks glucose uh, transport by inhibiting sodium-linked um, glucose transporters. Uh, fluorazin is the most abundant antioxidant in apple fruit skin, and it is a particularly effective antioxidant uh, in vitro. There have been a lot of reports about its other bio uh, bioactive functions, including lipid peroxidation, preventing bone loss, uh, etc. But it's not just important for, for health, it's also important in flavor. And these two compounds contribute uh, to the bitter taste of cider. And it's also important uh, in color because the dimerized oxidation products contribute to the color of apple juices. So dihydrochalcones are produced from the well-known phenylpropanoid pathway, and Natalia uh, introduced the, the very top part of that pathway, starting at PEL. There are other key compounds produced from this pathway, include uh, the color compounds, such as uh, anthocyanins, and health compounds, such as uh, quercetin and chlorogenic acid. But the dihydrochalcones are produced as a side branch, um, which occurs about halfway down and comes off at paracumeral coa. The key genes, uh, there are three key genes in um, DHC production. Um, the first uh, involves the enzyme chalcone synthase. Now, in most plants, chalcone synthase condenses three melanol coas plus one paracumeral coa to make naringin and chalcone. And this continues um, down through the phenylpropanoid pathway to things like anthocyanins. In Apple, Yahia and others in 2017 showed that there were multiple CHS enzymes that could use paracumeral coa to make naringin and chalcone in Apple. But they also showed that um, chalcone synthase in apple could use three melanol coas plus a compound dihydroparacumeral coa to make fluoritin. Now, CHS enzymes um, in pear can actually make um, fluoritin in um, vitro, but they can't do so in planta. And this suggested that. Um, that the production of the dihydrocumeral coa was the most um, important step uh, in apple. And people have been chasing um, the gene that does this um, particular step. 
And two enzymes in Apple have been shown to do this reduction step. Uh, the first one was an enyl uh, reductase that was reported by Deretel in 213. And then there was a second enzyme that was an alkanel reductase that was reported by Ibderatel in 2014. And what I've shown here is the reaction of the um, alkanol reductase, where you can see there is a peak for the substrate paracumarate and the production of the dihydrocumarate um, by this enzyme. We don't see the CoAs because um, the products and substrate were treated with sodium hydroxide, which broke open the esters. So this is being proposed to be the major um, uh, step uh, in DHCs, but it may not involve carbon double bond reductase um, of these types. It's possible that there might be an aringenin chalcone um, reductase occurring directly from aringenin chalcone across um, to fluoritin. And this activity was actually reported by Deretel in 2017 in apples but there has been no corresponding enzyme or genes um, actually uh, shown. Uh, the final step in DHC production is the glycosylation of fluoritin um, by UDP dependent glycosyl transferases. And glycosylation can occur at quite a number of positions um, on the ring structure of fluoritin, but fluorazin is produced by glycosylation at the two prime position. Uh, this was the um, this particular enzyme to do this reaction um, has been reported since 2008 um, by Jugder uh, et al. Um, and they reported the isolation of a fluoritin specific uh, glycosyl transferase um, that could produce fluorazin in vitro when given UDP glucose. And you can see that. Um, in the bottom reaction here uh, with a peak that corresponds to the production of fluorazin. The enzyme could also utilize UDP galactose um, to add this sugar at the same two prime position. But as far as we know, this only occurs in, in vitro as this compound is not found actually in apples. So my team has been really interested in manipulating the levels of dihydrochalcones uh, in planta using transgenic plants. And the first plants that we made targeted down regulation of chalcone synthase. Now chalcone synthase is a very well studied enzyme required for anthocyanin production. And you can go all the way back to 1990 to see where chalcone synthase was down regulated in petunia. And if you down regulate chalcone synthase, you can turn purple flowers into white with a range of um, interesting patterns caused by um, co-suppression. People have also down-regulated um, chalcone synthase in fruit, and uh, this is, shows a picture of strawberries where they did some transient down-regulation of chalcone synthase in, in strawberry, and you can convert um, the red fruit uh, into white fruit. So in the transgenic plants that uh, we made, we were able to show that pretty much all of the pathway components um, below chalcone synthase were severely downregulated in the transgenic lines that we made, and that there was a significant reduction in the amount of fluorazin produced um, as well. Uh, and in the best of the lines, we were well below 10% of the production of fluorazin. So looking at these plants was uh, quite a surprise. There were some expected phenotypes. The flowers on these plants were all white rather than the pink and wild type. The fruit never colored up because they can't produce anthocyanins. So there's the red fruit on the right and um, the knockout fruit on uh, the left. If you cut open the fruit, they were, they were look very similar. They had very poor seed set, but the transgenic fruit was slightly yellower than the, um, the wild type. But there were some very unexpected phenotypes. By knocking out chalcone synthase, we turned an apple tree into a bonsai dwarf tree. 
So instead of being a tree that was two to three meters high, um, the most severe of the transgenic lines only grew to um, about uh, 30 to 60 centimeters high. And this was caused by a really dramatic reduction in internode length. And that can be seen um, in the panel uh, in the center. There was also a, quite a dramatic change in leaf morphology. Um, the transgenic leaves were curled, narrow, and much, much smaller than are uh, present uh, in the wild type. So the question was, well, why was there such a dramatic change uh, in phenotype? And one explanation um, for this change in morphology was that there was a loss of flavonoids and dihydrochalcones results in increased auxin transport uh, throughout the plant and leads to the dwarfing. And we tested this hypothesis by looking at the movement of IAA um, in shoot cuttings dipped in radioactive IAA. And what we were able to see was that there was much greater uptake uh, in the transgenic shoots in the first um, centimeter of those shoots. And there was movement through the shoots as well. Um, and uh, coming out the other side, there was a lot more um, IAA effectively transported um, through the plant. So it looked as though um, this phenotype was related to a change in auxin transport. The second gene we manipulated um, in the pathway was um, the glycosyl transferase, um, uh, PGT1. And we did this because we believe this would be a much more specific block than knocking out uh, chalcone synthase. Um, and that this should have a much uh, less dramatic effect on plant phenotypes, as the main phenylpropanoid pathway would be left untouched. We predicted we might see an accumulation of the substrate uh, fluoritin. When we generated the plants and we looked at the biochemical changes, well, we were able to um, reduce the amount of fluorizin um, in the plants by between down to about 20 to 40 percent of what was present in wild type. Interestingly, we didn't get an accumulation of fluoritin, we got a reduction, but we also got a reduction in many other compounds, including those in the upper part of the pathway, including um, things like the paracumeric acid glycosyls and paracumeral quinic acid, but also a lot of compounds in the bottom of the pathway, catechins and camphoral glycosides and quercetin glycosides, and this was very much unexpected. And what was even more unexpected, given that PGT is like a terminal enzyme on a side branch, is that we basically reproduced the same phenotypes in, by knocking out the glycosyl transferase, as we'd seen with the, the chalcone synthase phenotypes. The plants were very much smaller um, throughout their growth from when they were very small, and the largest of the plants um, grew was between um, 60 and uh, 90 centimeters high. And we had very, very um, severe stunting um, and shortening of internodes um, uh, in the late season and autumn. Where the plants did produce fruit, they were always um, very small and very rarely had any seeds. And the picture on the right shows an example of um, one of the mature plants that we were able to produce. So why do we get the change in this phenotype? Well, in this case, we were able to show that um, expression act activity of the first pathway enzyme uh, in the phenylpropanoid pathway was um, strongly repressed. So in panel C, you can see the amount of um, activity of PAL that's present in Royal Gala, and next to it are a couple of transgenic lines, and the amount of PAL activity is much much lower. The amount of chalcone synthase activity was also severely reduced um, in the lines uh, as well. And if we looked at expression of genes, um, this matched, we were able to see that PAL was severely uh, repressed, 
although chalcone synthase um, was not. So what appeared to be occurring in these plants was that transient accumulation of fluoritin um, in the meristem um, was inhibiting the whole phenylpropanoid pathway um, via, um, via PAL. And that's why we're able to uh, recapitulate the dwarf phenotype that we saw with CHS. So the third enzyme, uh, the third set of transgenic plants that we targeted um, was at the chalcone isomerase um, step, uh, which is the step immediately following um, chalcone isomerase. In this case, our hypothesis was that apples may produce uh, a lot of dihydro chalcones because there was a block uh, in flux at the chalcone isomerase step. And our strategy was to drain away um, the flux being directed towards um, DHCs um, by overexpressing an enzyme from Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis CHI, that would bypass um, this break uh, in production. And hopefully we would be able to do this without accumulating any of the fluoritin that led to the downregulation of the whole pathway with the GT lines. So uh, these two graphs show that um, expression of most phenylpropanoid, phenylpropanoid joint, uh, genes is similar between apple and pear. So things like PAL, C4H, 4CL, and CHS are, are quite similar between apple and pear. There's a, um, a bit of a variation. But expression of the two chalcone isomerase genes is over 100 um, fold lower in apple. And that's why we thought there might be this um, break uh, in apple. And we can also see that this translates to a difference in activity. There's very little chalcone isomerase activity uh, in apple leaves, whereas it's quite high in pear leaves and it's also much lower than in tomato fruit. And this finding was true across multiple pear and apple cultivars for the expression. So when we looked at our CHI overexpression lines, what were the biochemical changes? Well, we were pleased to see that we were able to um, reduce fluorescein levels um, drastically uh, in the lines up to 95%. Uh, and as you might expect, by pushing more flux further down the pathway, we were able to increase the amount of um, flavonoids that are produced lower in the pathway. And that is the, shown here uh, on the, the right with the black bars. The amount of flavonoids goes up, um, may, maybe doubles. But the total levels of flavonoids um, plus DHCs was actually still greatly decreased because um, the convert, most of the um, fluorescein that was previously produced did not go into flavonoid um, production. So the good thing um, was that when we looked at the phenotypes of these plants, um, they were actually quite normal. In the, um, the CHS and the PGT plants, if we reduced the levels of fluorotin um, to 10% of wild type, we got these strange phenotypes. But by overexpressing CHI, we were able to um, get normal looking plants. The only phenotypes we were able to see was in a slight increase in anthocyanin production um, in very young leaves. And uh, this was mainly associated um, with the midribs. And um, you can see here that there's a bit more anthocyanin um, in the, le uh, the, the leaf margins. So this result suggested that the reduction in foliar fluorescein alone um, does not lead to the strong phenotypes that we saw in the CHS and the PGT1 lines. So what is the function of uh, fluorescein in apple leaves? Well, having these phenotypically normal lines allowed us to test what the effects of removing fluorescein had on response to herbivory. And we used uh, two spotted mites uh, 
as we'd seen that they infested the transgenic plants heavily uh, in the transgenic uh, greenhouse. And what we did was we used the choice assay where um, the mites were placed on a bridge between a transgenic leaf and a control leaf. And they were given the choice of uh, which leaf to move to and they were able to walk back across the bridge and go to the other leaf if they found their original choice uh, unsatisfactory. And the result in panel A shows that the majority of um, the two spotted mites um, preferred to go to the transgenic lines which had much reduced levels of fluorism. What we then did was we painted the outside of the transgenic leaves with uh, a, a level of fluorism that would match what was found in the wild type leaves. And we were able to show that we were able to complement um, the removal of fluorism. Once we added painted fluorism back onto the outside, the two spotted mites um, no longer preferred to go to the transgenic leaf, they equally chose to go to the wild type or the transgenic. So just changing gear a little bit here, and another dihydrochalcone in apple is um, trilobartan. And trilobartan is a positional isomer of fluorism, which I've been talking about. If the sugar, um, the glucose molecule is at the two prime position, it's fluorism, and this particular fluorism is known to be bitter. However, if you add the sugar molecule to the four prime position, that makes uh, trilobartan, and that is sweet, sweet tasting. And it's been shown to be at least 100 times sweeter than sucrose. And there's quite a lot of formulation patents coming out by companies like Coca-Cola and Jevedan where they have um, looked to use uh, trilobartan in some of their product formulations. And so why are we and they interested in trilobartan? Well, obesity is a global epidemic and this is leading to big increases uh, in diabetes. And a lot of that is associated with um, increased sugar uh, consumption. And the big companies um, look to reduce sugar by using natural low calorie sweeteners like stevia, which is quite widely available now, but also things like sorbitol, xylitol, and erythritol. Uh, there are other sources of natural low calorie sweeteners like monk fruit and thalmatin, but trilobartan also falls into this class and this is the main reason that we followed it up. So the key enzyme for making trilobartan in malus is uh, a four prime glycosyl transferase. And two of these have actually been reported in apples before, one by Yahaya in 2016 and one by Gauchetel in 2012. And both of them reported that the, they had identified uh, that these enzymes had four prime OGT activity in vitro. The problem is that both of these genes are express, expressed in domesticated apple, um, which don't actually produce any trilobartan. And trilobartan is really only produced in uh, crab apples like Malus cyboli, Malus trilobata, and Malus adams. And there was no genetic evidence that the enzymes that had been described um, as having this activity were actually important in planter. So what my team did was uh, we used um, uh, a number of different strategies to identify this key enzyme. Um, by The first one we used was activity-directed protein purification um, from a wild species, Malus adams, that makes trilobartan and using a range of um, purifications, Q-cephros, phenylcephros, um, superdex, uh, we were able to um, purify the activity and we sent the, the band that was arrowed in the gel there off for identification and it came back as being uh, uh, a UDP glycosol transferase 88A1 like and it matched to this particular um, gene model, 836043. So this was 
a good starting point that we might be on the right track. But we also looked for differential expression to see if we could um, identify genes that were highly expressed in species producing trilobartan versus species that were not producing trilobartan. And it turned out that the, the gene that was most differentially expressed between um, these um, different lines was the same match to the same gene model. And there was a log sevenfold difference in the expression between trilobartan producing species and cultivated apples. So from this, uh, this particular gene, 836043 became our key candidate. And this is a glycosyl transferase that actually turns out to be in the same um, family as MDPGT1, which is the glycosyl transferase um, that adds the sugar at the two prime position. So we mapped the production of trilobartan to the bottom of linkage group seven in the leaves of a segregating population. And we found that there was a Mendelian segregation of one, one to one and that the 836043 gene sat directly below that QTL. And we were able to develop some specific markers that were 100% accurate in predicting the production of trilobartan in uh, apple leaf material. So if we look at the particular locus at the bottom of linkage group seven, there are actually two glycosyl transferases um, uh, present at that particular uh, locus. 836043, we named MDPGT2, and the uh, paralog we named uh, MDPGT3. And so it was possible that either of these two genes might be responsible for making trilobartan, but um, we went on to prove this biochemically. So what I've shown here is the activity um, of MDPGT2, and we were able to show that that was able to produce um, trilobartan uh, in vitro if you fed it fluoritin. Um, and so uh, the standards are shown in the top lines. MDPGT2 is the third line, and if it's fed fluoritin, you can make um, trilobartan from fluoritin. Interestingly, MDPGT3 was only able to produce um, fluorism, so it's another two prime um, glycosyl transferase. MDPGT2 was also only expressed in um, plants that produced uh, trilobartan and was not expressed in any lines uh, where trilobartan was not produced. So after this, we produced some transgenic um, overexpressing lines and produced that in two domestica apple cultivars, GL3 and Royal Gala. And we were able to identify lines where there was a lot of overexpression of PG2 in the leaves. And I'm sorry, there's a bit of a complicated figure, but um, the black bars there show the level of trilobartan and only the overexpressing lines um, produced trilobartan. So we took these plants um, into field trial in China and we looked to investigate uh, the physiological effects of trilobartan on morphology, herbivory and disease. Uh, we found absolutely no effects on um, morphology. The plants grew absolutely um, the same as wild type, the leaves all look normal. And in the field trial conditions, we found no difference uh, in herbivory and disease. The only um, disease that seemed to infect either wild type or the transgenics in this field trial was powdery mildew, and that was um, present in both the transgenics and the wild types. And so the last thing uh, we did was we did some century trials of apple leaf tea made from the transgenic PGT2 lines versus tea made from the wild type leaves. And we did this um, with the collaborators in China. And we were able to show that transgenic leaf teas made from lines overexpressing trilobartan 
were two to three points sweeter on a 10 point scale compared to wild type leaves, showing that trilobartan, um, if it's present in um, domestica, can actually change uh, the sweetness um, perception of um, the leaves. Now, of course, it would be nice to do that in fruit, but it takes a long time to produce the plants. So some conclusions. Um, our studies have identified many of the key genes involved in fluorizin and trilobartan biosynthesis in apple. We've shown that perturbing the phenylpropanoid pathway at CHS um, or PGT1 affects plant morphology. Um, but this isn't a result of the reduced levels of DHCs as the um, chalcone isomerase overexpression plants have almost no DHCs but grow normally. Uh, reducing total DHC and flavonoid content lightly affects auxin transport and causes changes in um, plant morphology. The PGT1 knockdown lines accumulate reactive fluoritin, which downregulates the whole phenylpropanoid pathway, and CHS knockdowns um, reduce levels of DHCs and lower pathway compounds are greatly reduced. Uh, reducing fluorizin levels affects infestation by two spotted mites but we're not sure what other roles DHCs have in plant defense, whether they have any other effects on other insects, fungi and bacterial pathogens, but now we have some tools to actually address that. And overexpressing trilobartan and apple leaves makes them sweeter, but we don't know at the moment um, if overexpressing trilobartan and fruit makes them sweeter. So finally, I'd like to um, thank my colleagues at Plant and Food Research, particularly uh, Andrew Dare and Yaching Yuk, who have done a, a huge amount of this work, and my collaborators at Northwest Agriculture and Forestry University, particularly Yula Wang and uh, Pongman Lee, who've been working with me on Trilobartan, and I thank the, the people that gave me the money, which is the New Zealand Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Thank you. Thank you, Ras. Uh, can I say, uh, uh, request Rajiv to summarize? Rajiv? Sure, sir. So, uh, thanks very much for the presentation, Ross. So, it was an interesting uh, lecture where uh, you have explained the uh, modulation of dihydrochalcons in apple and its effects on uh, plant morphology and overall the uh, Phenyl uh, levels in uh, plant. So it was an interesting topic, and also it was uh, nice to know that uh, at the end of the lecture, that uh, the uh, overexpressed overexpress leaves are also used for uh, making tea, and it <laughs> gives a better quality. Thanks very much. Over to you, Ajit. Thank you somebody very much. Has a, somebody has a question: How the knockdowns are being generated? How were the knockdowns generated? Uh, we use agrobacterium. Yeah. Uh, we use agrobacterium mediated transformation, um, and we um, generate the apple lines. And in New Zealand, we grow them in containment, um, and it takes three to five years for them to fruit. Um, we are lucky with things like the dihydrochalcones that we can um, assay them in leaves, but we were working on other compounds. We generally have to wait much longer um, to get the plants to fruit. Rajiv. Uh, hi, Ras. This is Dinesh here. Hi, Dinesh. Very wonderful talk, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving the talk in this session. Uh, we had to reschedule your talk because your one one could not join. So oh, okay. Yeah, so thank you so much. And uh, I just have one question like, is it like in New Zealand, uh, these triacinic uh, trees are allowed to 
like uh, grow the fruits for commercial purpose? No. Um, in New Zealand, the regulations are very strict, and uh, the reason that I have taken the plants uh, to the collaborators in China is that they are able to take them outside uh, into field conditions, whereas in New Zealand we're not allowed to take them outside containment and we're not allowed to taste um, our transgenic fruit or leaves at all. And so uh, the collaborators um, have access to doing that type of experiment and that's absolutely critical if you're, you're interested in understanding the role in flavour and also understanding what the role uh, of the compounds is if you're looking at um, disease interactions, you really want to get your plants out and see how they perform uh, in the field as well, not just in a greenhouse. Okay. So it's yeah, very, very tough in New Zealand. Hopefully better in yeah, India. Yeah, same here, same here. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, same here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, uh, uh, hello, uh, Dr. Ross, there are some questions. Would you uh, uh, should I put them? Uh, I'm Manoj Sengar from CMAP. If uh, Dr. Uh, Rajiv can see in the question answer session. You okay. just go to the question answer. There are two, three questions for uh, Dr. Ross. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Ross, one of the question uh, Dr. Sachin has already asked how the knockouts were generated. The yes. second question is uh, whether PGT2 is an UGT or other GT family members. Sorry, the quality of the connection just went out there. I missed the. Can, can I just put it for you? Uh, okay. Whether PGT2 is an UGT or other uh, GT family member? Oh, uh, PGT2 is a UGT family member. Um, it's a member of uh, family 88A. Um, okay. And PGT1 is a member of UGT 88F. So they're in the same family, um, but they're um, only about. 40% identical at the amino acid level. Okay, so there is one more question. Uh, which variety of apple you are using in the research? Uh, so in New Zealand, we use Royal Gala. This is uh, a commercial variety which we know very well and has good fruit and good fruit char characteristics. Um, in China, our collaborators use a variety called GL3, and this uh, is not a commercial variety, but has really high transformation um, capacity. So they are able to generate a lot of plants, but they take much longer to fruit. So we have the, the choice between getting plants quickly, but they take longer to fruit, or plant, getting uh, plants that take longer to produce, but uh, they fruit quicker. So it's a matter of deciding exactly what phenotype you want most. Okay. And uh, there is one more question for you. Uh, how many enzymes and steps are required to produce the trilobatin? And is it possible to produce outside? Uh, so you can make trilobatin, um, you only need three enzymes. Um, and we were able to show that you could take the three enzymes that I showed and overexpress those in tobacco and that you could get tobacco to produce trilobatin. Um, we've also um, engineered yeast to, try, um, to, to make trilobatin, so you can put the three genes into yeast and um, do it outside a plant. Okay. And uh, uh, maybe we'll take a last question. Uh, Dr. Navin uh, is asking. I, I have a question. I have a question. Okay. Okay. Yep. Can I? Can I? Can I have a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ross, uh, yes. is uh, uh, that chalcon synthage? Is it yes. uh, reported to be feedback inhibited? Uh, they didn't report it in the paper, but my. I would think it's likely to be um, substrate inhibited from my experience. Okay. Okay. Dinesh, your last question. 
No, this is not my question. It is a question from a uh, attendee, Dr. Navin Wist. He is having a question on uh, whether uh, any idea about the activity of PGT3, Dr. Ross. Uh, so PGT3 um, is uh, able to glycosylate fluoritin at the two prime position to make uh, fluoridzin. Uh, so it's an, it has the same uh, activity as PGT1, but it is not highly expressed uh, in fruit. There are a number of other enzymes that have been shown to have the ability to glycosylate fluoritin in vitro. So if you do it um, in vitro, quite a number of GTs can actually do that reaction. But as far as we know, the only enzyme that is important in the plant is PGT1. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ras. Thank you for uh, the nice lecture. Uh, can we proceed for the next uh, uh, lecture, Dinesh? Sure. Yeah. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumar. Sanjay, sir. Sanjay, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sir, before your lecture, I'll speak a little bit about uh, you uh, uh, for the uh, for the researchers and for the students uh, to know about you a little bit, if you permit me, sir. Uh, uh, you will be speaking on augmenting pathways for secondary metabolite synthesis in Himalayan plants. Dr. Sanjay Kumar, CSR Institute of Himalayan Bioresource Technology, India, is presently the director of CSR IHBT, Palampur. His major, major research contribution include discovery of a novel carbon, carbon fixation pathway and its transplantation in a heterologous system to reduce photorespiratory losses leading to photosynthetic gain and yield enhancement, decipering the mechanism of winter dormancy and drought, trace, uh, drought, drought stress in tea, enumerating molecular aspects of secondary metabolism in medicinal plants for catechin, picrocytes, Steviocytes, siconins, podophyllotoxin biosynthesis. His research has made significant contribution in development of nutraceuticals using traditional and Ayurvedic knowledge for Himalayan, Himalayan plants. So uh, many more has to be can be said about him. But I I, I will stop here and will uh, listen to his lecture to know more about his research. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, can I share my screen now or somebody is sharing the screen? No, sir, you can share my screen, sir. Now I can share, right? Can you all see the screen now? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Ajit, uh, for this introduction. And I must thank you all and the organizer to give me this opportunity to share some of our views. Uh, since this session is on plant specialized metabolism and metabolic engineering, I thought it would be a nice idea to give you some idea about the specialized metabolism, particularly for the Himalayan plants. Uh, so, little bit of primary metabolism also I will include and a little bit of secondary metabolism work that we are doing in our institute. And why Himalayas and Himalayan plant are different and to give you a perspective because we are having altitude. Himalayas have a lot of altitude and as you go along the altitude, you know there is decrease in the partial pressure of gases, particularly CO2, O2 and all those gases. Temperature will go down, radiation will go up. And then it poses a logistic problem. So one of the first questions that we asked and uh, which uh, Ajit also mentioned in his introduction that we worked a lot on uh, photosynthesis and photorespiration. And I thought just two or three slides about this work I'll give you. So uh, since there was a lot of difference in the partial pressure at low altitude and high altitude, particularly if you compare, say, uh, 
1000 meter versus 4000 meter you can imagine 3000 meter difference so the partial pressure is around 40 percent low as compared to plant at low altitude so we were wondering how the photosynthesis responds and uh, to our surprise what we realized that at high altitude uh, for, there is no effect on the rate of photosynthesis. You grow the same plant at low altitude and high altitude and you find the same results. So our interest was to see is there any alteration in the pathway or how plant adapts. And it, once we did this carbon tracing experiment, very interesting results came out. Like for example, all plants were C3 and PGA was their primary product of photosynthesis. As you go up at high altitude, you start getting uh, radioactivity into C4 compound like for example aspartate and that was something very intriguing although there is no change in the uh, anatomy of the plant but there is change in the metabolism. So we analyze all the enzymes and further in-depth studies into radio tracer experiment and then we came out with very interesting pathway that at high altitude in C3 plant along with Rubisco PEP carboxylase also functions. And because of functioning of PEP carboxylase, a lot of oxaloacetate is produced. And this oxaloacetate is, met, is channelized towards amino acid biosynthesis, particularly this aspartate. And now it will need nitrogen. So nitrogen comes through photorespiratory pathway. So it was a very interesting uh, pathway that came out and uh, we discovered this pathway basically that you know this is a very nice way that plant can con conserve carbon as well as nitrogen. So if you see in the University of Minnesota there was a course on photosynthesis and there was a chapter written by Ellen and Bell and they included our work and said that you know how the altitude and carbon dioxide they are affecting the photosynthesis and uh, uh, it, it was you know a course material for that uh, university also in the on photosynthesis. Now, we had some tool, we knew that if you have to conserve carbon and nitrogen, how the uh, plant adapts itself and which are the important genes or, or the enzymes which are involved. So we thought why not to use this information and uh, study how the other plants at lower altitude would behave. So we took three genes of this pathway, one was aspartate amino transferase, second was glutamine synthetase and third was the carboxylase. And you, if you put these three genes, and then you can see on the right-hand panel, the transgenic had very broad leaves, and it was very encouraging. So phenotype was very different. And if you analyze the yield parameters, I'm not showing all other data, but this final data, this transgenic plant had very improved seed yield. And it was very interesting to see that even at low concentration of nitrogen, the seed yield was higher. So the same plant, uh, you know, would perform much better even at low nitrogen. So it means the plant has some mechanism to conserve carbon and nitrogen. So we wanted to understand how this plant uh, does its job uh, in terms of conservation of carbon and nitrogen. Now, if you analyze, so we fed the plant with C14 and try to see the flux of carbon towards sugar, amino acid and various metabolites, organic acids and all other metabolites. And it was very interesting to see a lot of flux goes towards sucrose, sucrose biosynthesis. And in transgenic plant, you can see here I have highlighted a lot of carbon goes towards aspartate and not to malate. And it confirms our previous hypothesis that, you know, carbon is channelized through pepper boxes towards OA biosynthesis. And this oxaloacetate pushes carbon into the aspartate and it might be using the nitrogen which is evolved during photorespiration. Now to understand that, we studied the photosynthesis rate and you can see there, there is a fantastic enhancement in photosynthetic rate at least by 20%. And also, if you see the photorespiratory rate in all our transgenics, photorespiration was much lesser, around 10 to 20%. And it was very interesting because, you know, whole world is trying to convert C3 plant into C4 plant so that they can minimize the photorespiratory losses. And here we were getting some tools. Now we wanted to understand further that, you know, because during photorespiration, one is CO2 is evolved and second is ammonia is evolved. Now, if you see our transgenic line, they had 
lesser accumulation of ammonia even at different hours of illumination. It means there is some way that nitrogen is not eliminated during this photorespiratory process. So we thought we should conduct some experiment using the inhibitor and we use INH and MSO. You know, as you must be aware that INH is the inhibitor of glycine decarboxylase and MSO is the inhibitor of glutamine synthetase. And we thought if we give this inhibitor, we'll come out with some ideas what happens to this photorespiratory process because we wanted to estimate the source of uh, photorespired ammonia. And if you give this, and very interesting result came, uh, you can see from this graph, the graph which is open, that shows the, uh, you know, ammonia accumulated in, uh, without any inhibitor, and you can see transgenic line had much lower concentration of ammonia. But moment you give this inhibitor, and particularly if you monitor the photorespiratory ammonia, you can see photorespiratory ammonia evolution is same in all the plants. So what this particular experiment confirmed that ammonia which is released during photorespiratory process actually is refixed. So that is the first proof that our institute gave and then our this paper was uh, it received much attention and now you can see F1000 prime which is now known as faculty opinion they said that this is a very interesting paper particularly for improving nitrogen use efficiency shield in and biomass so what i wanted to say because this session was on specialized metabolism so i thought let me give you some idea that even primary metabolism it gets affected as you go, go up at the high altitude and if this primary metabolism gets affected, then there is likelihood that it will impact the secondary metabolism. Why? You can see this particular graph and you can see the primary metabolite, for example, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or erythrose 4-phosphate, which are the result of glycolysis or oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. These are the two major precursors which either enter through shikimate pathway MVA pathway, MEP pathway, and you know, then they give rise to either uh, through terpenoid pathway, flavonoid pathway, phenyl propionide pathway, or shikimate pathway, various type of molecules, whether there are flavonoids, terpenoids, or lignans, or lignans, all these are derived from this primary metabolic pathways. So that was our interest. If primary metabolism is affected, how sec secondary metabolism would be affected? Right, and to understand that we use some specialized plants such as uh, you know, tea, pigrorhiza, podophyllum, stevia, arnebia, very interesting plant which are there in Himalayas. And we wanted to understand how the secondary metabolite, what are the genes which are involved in this pathway? Can we manipulate this pathway? Can we develop some system uh, of uh, production of this metabolite? So I'll show you some of those things. For example, we are into this gene discovery so that um, we can manipulate this pathway or we can improve any rate limiting step. These are our two major objectives. I give you first perspective on T. As you must be aware, T has uh, uh, around 25 to 30 percent flavonoid known as catechins. And these catechins are very important molecules. And we have a lot of interest. Even in COVID time, you know, one of our recent paper came out, it showed, uh, although it was a bioinformatic paper, which showed that uh, various proteins of uh, COVID-19, they are inhibited by some of the molecules present in tea uh, and uh, like, you know, thioflavin-3, gallate and uh, thiocyanensis D, etc. So some of the molecules of tea are very effective against COVID. So that was our interest to understand various metabolic pathways in tea. And as you must be aware, thioflavin come from catechin biosynthetic pathways because catechins they join together and make this molecule known, known as thioflavin. And you know when we had started this work it was long back and at that time neither these tools were available and uh, neither right genotype was available. So what was our approach to clone various genes of this pathway? That was our first effort. So we created some situations which can modulate the catechin content and using those conditions, like for example, drought, ABA, GA3, and wounding, we did a lot of differential display experiments 
and based on that we identified differentially expressed genes and based on that we were, then you know we used to have one full length genes then we used to do a lot of um, ex vitro experiment also whether they can convert one compound into another and based on that uh, we could complete the whole flavonoid biosynthetic pathway of tea and now and then we had series of publication in this area and now we knew precisely that which are regulatory genes in this pathway now we thought we since we had all these genes of the pathway we thought can we transplant this pathway into heterologous system or not so in tobacco actually we tried and one particular gene anthocyanin reductase because tobacco is also having flavonoid pathway operative very vigorously but one of the genes which was missing in tobacco or which was at very low level of expression was anthocyanin reductase so we put this anthocyanin reductase gene into tobacco and uh, you can see it was fantastic to see that you know even flowers of tobacco were uh, pinkish in color and they developed a lot of flavonoid uh, from 0 uh, to around 1.8% uh, of the fresh weight we could get this uh, anth uh, you know flavonoid production so uh, what my point is that if you have some such tools in your hands and you have the right type of gene you can actually manipulate this metabolic pathway and also produce some of the important metabolite into heterologous system so this was one successful uh, example uh, from our lab onto this flavonoid biosynthetic pathway second uh, i would like to touch upon a briefly on this picorrhiza curva you know this is a very interesting plant and it has a molecule known as picrocyte and as you can see uh, there are two major picrocyte one is picrocyte 1 and picrocyte 2 and both of them differ mainly due to presence of a side chain where picrocyte 1 has got cinnamate whereas picrocyte 2 has got vanillate so these two these have two different moieties particularly in rat model and uh, we showed it beyond doubt that it helps a lot and also picrocytes uh, why we were interested to see because they also reduce the renal damage uh, that we showed uh, uh, again in rat model and uh, this was something uh, interesting and just to let you know that what was the re reason of interest into this molecule known as picrocytes uh, from our institute and when we try to analyze this picrocyte we found that they are present not only in root but also in the leaves and uh, traditionally people used to say that you know only leaves are are the source of picrocyte but our data clearly showed root as well as leaves both of them have got this picrocyte so we uh, wrote an article that why a fruit picrocyte curva once you have uh, the same molecule into the leaf tissue but anyway but our objective was to understand what regulates the synthesis of this picrocyte and how the environmental factors play a role and very interesting let me tell you that low temperature particularly 15 degree celsius so we did a uh, you know time uh, temperature series of experimentation particularly when uh, low temperature is coupled to light conditions there is synthesis of picrocytes and we showed it beyond doubt that it is light and the uh, low temperature which allows picrocyte synthesis to go on so now we had a tool that light and dark condition as well as low and high temperature which can give us lot many tools uh, to understand this picrocyte biosynthesis now earlier you know when i was presenting my work on t at that time you know modern tools were not available and by that time this transcript uh, you know next generation sequencing came into picture and we published uh, you know this uh, and also uh, bring brought out the whole transcript from picrocyte curva and we published this whole work and based on that it was very easy to decipher this whole metabolic pathway and we knew very precisely that um, how various pathways are functioning whether whether it was mevalonate pathway non mevalonate pathway or the shikimate pathway which plays a role in terms of um, synthesis of the ceruloid molecule so we could make whole this pathway uh, uh, you know using our ngs uh, or the uh, platform and also we developed this small rna sequencing and try to see how the temperature modulates and based on that we knew that at high temperature that 25 degree celsius become a stress for this plant species and at uh, 25 degree celsius all the pathways of 
ethylene biosynthesis, ABA biosynthesis, brisinosteroid, all these pathways are upregulated, serine threonine, protein kinase, phosphatase pathway. So 25 degrees Celsius, this plant doesn't like our high altitude plant. And uh, all this pathway gets upregulated and, you know, plant shuts from all this mechanism. So having understood this, then we wanted to understand at low temperature, which are the important genes. And by this time, we have all the genes, full length genes of this pathway available with us. And we realized that it is the MEP pathway, which is very important, which regulates picrocyte biosynthesis at low temperature. And once we knew uh, this uh, genes of MEP pathway are important, and some genes of MVA pathway were also playing some important role. So we thought, why not to understand their gene regulation? So we thought of cloning their promoters. So we cloned promoter of large number of um, uh, genes from this picuriza curva. And the two, three things I'll come later, the two, three important promoters we thought were very interesting for us. For example, if you see light responsive motifs, you had GATA and sol leaf motifs. And uh, then uh, in uh, signaling molecule, we find preponderance of uh, this W box or the worky boxes, so, right? So these two important things we came, which you know emerged from the analysis of these promoters. So we tried to do a lot of promoter analysis. We did a lot of deletion experiment just to see which part of the promoter is important to impart that particular trait. For example, using this HMGR promoter, we knew that if you have this partial promoter, uh, you know, like for example, here I am showing you various fragments. The smaller fragment did not work, and the, it was only that full length promoter which was, um, you know, showing the activities. So we thought, why not to evaluate what is there in this promoter? Which, does this promoter regulate uh, temperature and light regulation of the gene expression? So, uh, since in Picuriza curva, we did not have the proper system of expression. So we did this experiment in Aerobdopsis and Aerobdopsis also we got very evident temperature and light regulation. But very interestingly, although in Picuriza curva, uh, these genes used to get expressed at, uh, higher at light, uh, under light condition in Picuriza curva, in Aerobdopsis, it was the other way around, probably because of the presence of um, uh, certain binding, uh, other binding proteins. And to prove this, uh, you know, we tried to analyze some of the promoter, particularly GATA and solid uh, uh, boxes. And very interesting, you know, GATA box was earlier uh, characterized. Sorlip was the first uh, report from our institute that Sorlip exhibits light binding activity. And our data very clearly showed that GATA and Sorlip, although Sorlip uh, we said that it is the sequence which is overrepresented in light induced promoters, but actually salt lip binds uh, under uh, light condition, whereas GATA, which is supposed to be a light responsive element, it used to bind with the dark induced protein. So it means one is positive regulator and one is negative regulator. So this very interesting thing came up from our results, uh, particularly for uh, Picuriza curva. And in aerobdopsis, when we repeated this experiment with aerobdopsis protein, the uh, pattern was altogether opposite. So it means picuriza and uh, aerobdopsis, they behave differently for these boxes and which could be because of binding of these proteins uh, to these motifs. So this very interesting observation came uh, from our lab uh, that, you know, some of these boxes can play a very, very important role. So, and now we are using this GATA and the salt lip boxes to alter these various processes. And in the meantime, uh, I wanted to mention and bring your attention to one important box that was Verki box. And you know, and Verkis are involved in range of uh, these metabolites. And when we see Verki boxes were in abundance in all these promoters. So we thought, why not to characterize these Verkis? And uh, we saw these Verki boxes and we find that the uh, this work is uh, the W box, they exhibit protein binding activity, it means that they show some functionality. So we thought why not to see the genes which are expressing or which are the which bind to this W boxes and how those genes regulate the, uh, you know, secondary metabolite synthesis. So when we try to clone various work genes, 
we found two very interesting workages. One gene had one site for binding to the W box and another gene has double site to bind to the W box. So we cloned both the genes. And when we try to see those genes under different light conditions uh, and dark condition, uh, W, you know, the worky box, which, which had two uh, boxes, they always responded positively with the microcyte content, whereas the single box containing gene always re responded in the negative direction. So now we had two different type of workies with us. One responded positively with the um, with our um, picrocyte content, and second responded negatively with the picrocyte content. So then we try to uh, do functional analysis, and we found that W worky which had got the two boxes, it showed transcription act activation that we analyze in um, E system, and since we did not have a proper transgenic system for mycorrhiza curva. We try to analyze these genes in tobacco and trying to see whether in tobacco also they can modulate uh, um, MV or MEB pathway or not. And we did find that in tobacco also they can modulate transient experiment. They can modulate particularly worky gene which has got double uh, uh, box binding ability. So now we are having one worky gene which we can play and once the transgenic system in picoriza will be available, probably we will have some more chance to play with these genes. But then in the meantime, we wanted to develop some production system for this um, uh, picoriza curva because in picoriza curva, we know that it is an endangered species. There is no cultivation. So we developed a production system for picoriza curva. And now we take tons and tons of this picoriza curva from lab to the field. Right. So at one hand, we try to understand the gene regulation. On the other hand, uh, and also we try to see what are the bioactive molecule. On the other hand, we try to push this plant survival and uh, rehabilitate this important endangered species into the field. This was about picoriza curva. So now we had a system uh, like, for example, in T, I told you, we had the complete pathway and that pathway we could transplant and we could have a system for shikonin pro uh, of uh, uh, catechin production. With picoriza curva, we have the intense gene experimentation where our job, where, you know, our major contribution on was in identification of a sorlip as a functional unit under light condition. And also, uh, we could say that the worky gene, which is having two W box binding domain, they are more important and they always relate positively with the picrocyte content. Now, another third important plant I thought I'll share with you was on this um, uh, shikonin production. And as you know, shikonin is produced in a plant known as Arnibia euchroma, which has around 1.5 to 2% in shikonin content. And we very clearly established that uh, this plant uses MVA pathway for the synthesis of this important color moiety. So we had this complete genes in our hand and the complete system with our hand. And today we have a system whereby we have either a shikonin production system, zero or high shikonin production system. And today using all this information, uh, where, uh, you know, under natural condition, you take four to five years for production of uh, shikonin. Uh, we can have a system of production technology uh, in just in 45 days. And particularly for such long term species, which take a real long time, such technologies can be very, very useful. So here we use various uh, data which we have generated over a period of time uh, on how the shikonin, is, uh, shikonin production is con um, controlled. So we use all this information and develop this system. And um, very soon this paper would be out. Right now the whole thing is under patenting. And uh, I thought I'll share this small information with you. Uh, just one or two slides more and then I'll finish my presentation. Uh, uh, because some things that we are doing in other plant system also. For example, in steviol biosynthesis, uh, if you see, we have uh, since 2012 uh, to till date, we are continuously publishing on this important species 
we have complete pathways in our hand and we are to produce now these things into ex vitro system so that we have this important molecule known as stevocytes as you are aware just in the previous talk we heard that the stevocyte is around 300 times sweeter than the sugar and uh, particularly for diabetics it will be something fantastic molecule and uh, we are trying to do uh, so now we have a, a variety that we have developed through breeding based on this our gene you know we did all this selection uh, with the genes that we are having so now our uh, we have a variety which is having a very high rhodiocyte content because you know in stevia there is a problem that um, stevocyte is little bitter in taste rhodiocyte is sweeter in taste so we uh, use the variety with high rhodiocyte content so we have now that higher rhodiocyte content variety with us and we put you know this variety into the field we have taken to the field and a lot of people are using our variety so just to give you an idea that if you have complete gene expression profiling with you you know which gene you are looking for and you can do mass selection based on the gene um, and you can also that can also be helpful in development of variety and taking to the field so this is um, uh, you know in stevia we are again having uh, a uh, very good command as far as molecular biology and also field activities are concerned uh, this is just to show that in general high altitude plant do not like high temperature and even temperature like 25 degree centigrade become a sort of stress which our genomics data showed very very evidently and certainly pathway uh, remains with us now very important question so this would be my last slide so very important question that we are asking now that how this plant metabolism or this metabolic pathways respond to climate change scenario particularly our high altitude plant and what we have found that uh, while the higher co2 favors synthesis of some of the secondary metabolite temperature may not be favorable uh, favoring the synthesis of this compound although a uh, work is under process more work is needed to conclude something positively but this is something a future way that we are going into this plant secondary metabolite synthetic pathway so the several students who helped us and some of the scientists who contributed right from kashmir who is now in punjab university aarti is in bangalore in company seva singh parul so all our students they have contributed into this area two of our scientists shashi bhushan and shiv shankar pande Uh, Shri Shankar earlier was at CMAP. Now he is with us. So we all are working towards in this area, and our work is supported by DBT, Nimitli, NTRF, and certainly by CSIR, our parent organization. Thank you so much. Um, over to you all. कार्बन एंड नाइट्रोजन फ्लक्स एंड ऑल्सो इट वॉज नाइस वे टू कॉर्लेट दाइमरी मेटाबोल and uh, sir explain the details about uh, the environmental regulation as well as the transcription factors and other genes modulate the secondary metabolic pathways in himalayan various himalayan and at the end it was a nice way also to conclude how uh, the high altitude plants respond to a climatic change thank you very much for your time and thanks sir thanks a lot i have some announcement sir uh, 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 you are a authority of uh, uh, a high altitude plant we respect your uh, uh, findings uh, life log findings what you have done in science you have contributed a lot so uh, once again i thank you uh, now uh, one announcement i will make that uh, we will break for 10 minutes here and after that we will rejoin after 10 10 minutes uh, in the same link the same link will be uh, uh, so you can keep open the link and please rejoin after 10 minutes and dr 
Bowman, Professor Bowman, uh, he is facing difficulty in connection, so he may not be joining today. So he may join in the next session, which will be announced later on. When he will be joining, maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So we will find out a special uh, uh, slot for him. So uh, we will continue with the rest of the speakers in the uh, after 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice organization, nice way to interact with the whole community. Thanks, Prabodh, yes, for, uh, for this fantastic organization. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very, very well thought of. Thank you, sir. So we leave now and join after 10 minutes or so. Sir. Sir. Yes.
Hello. Hello. Yeah. 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 Doctor, yeah. 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 we are able to hear you. Hello, Dinesh. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we, can yeah. hear you. we can. We can hear and we can see you. Both. Both video and audio is coming. You can see me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll keep this one. Hello, Prabhupada. Dinesh. Dinesh. Hello, Dinesh. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Dinesh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just I'll uh, share one slide. Can you see that? Yeah, Pop please. Topic? Please, please. Uh, Tulsiram camp? Yes. Can you see my uh, slide? No. Uh, Is it not live or what? You like it. slide. Yeah, let's come here. Yeah. I think Monod has to take out his slide. No, 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 now it's coming. Your content is shared. I have taken out, sir. I have taken out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah
presentation mode, then you can share your screen, sir. Presentation mode में scare scene scare नहीं हो सकता. नहीं बास बास करो बना सर वो F5 कर दीजिए उसको. सर कर रहा हूँ. सर slide show करो. आया अभी एक्सप्लेन नाउ यस तो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन सो आई एम वेलकम बैक यू ऑल टू द सेशन सो इट्स माय प्लेजर टू इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर अजीत कुमार सशनी हु इज द चीफ साइंटिस्ट एंड हेड ऑफ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी डिवीजन एट सेंट्रल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मेडिसिन एंड एरोमेटिक प्लांट्स लखनऊ इस एरिया ऑफ इंटरेस्ट इज इन फंक्शनल जीनोमिक्स एंड प्रोटीमिक्स of uh, medicinal aromatic plants uh, its group has deciphered uh, and functionally characterized several genes uh, from medicinal and aromatic plants and also the first transcriptome and genome sequence of uh, basil was reported from uh, dr sachne's group so in addition to his excellent contribution in basic science i would like to also mention here that uh, he received three times the csr technology award and also he has pioneered the research uh, and have released several uh, improved varieties of medicinal and aromatic plant uh, thank you very much sir now it's over to you thank you rajib i think i am audible uh, yes uh, yes the sir the title yes. of the talk is secondary metabolite channeling and pathway genomics i'll try to finish it within the time allotted to me 30 minutes and route to better harvest so uh, the secondary metabolite channeling for the specialized metabolites how it happens inside the plants mainly the medicinal and aromatic plants i may not touch the primary metabolites i'll go for the secondary metabolites specifically so uh, the first question slides are moving it seems why plant produce secondary metabolites slides are moving yes sir moving sir Okay. So, the plant uh, has all the plants in the nature. They are they are highly diverse. It starts from algae, fungi, gymnosperms, angiosperms, halophytes, uh, bryophytes, insectivorous plants, uh, epiphytes. You you tell you tell what are different type of ecological interaction and name the plants. The plants are facing different type of diversity in nature. So they face extremity. Disease, sap, salinity, drought. There are uh, micro insect interactions, the symbiosis, attraction, association. Already you have listened to the talk of Natalia. What uh, the aroma compounds they do? What is the significance of the aroma compounds? So the secondary metabolites they do a lot of work inside the plants. We have a immune system. The plant they, they don't have a immune system like the animals. So what they do? The secondary metabolites they produce, which actually are helpful for their immune response in a different way. So what is there in the plants armory? There are terpenoids, alkaloids, flavonoids, phenylpropanoid, lignans, polyketides, glycosides, saponins. We give the name according to our own uh, convenience and depending upon the functions what they are doing inside the plants. so which plants will produce what what determines it so if you see a picture this is a complex picture but very simple so in a specific plant there are diverse metabolites and in diverse plant there are specific metabolites both the things are correct so this you see there are many plants so there are if you take the terpenes the terpenes are being common terpenes are produced in many plants different plant diverse plant as well as diverse plant produce diverse terpenes so these are the first channel if you if you go to the uh, terpenes the monoterpenes they are produced in different plants i have given the plant list 
likewise sesquiterpenes triterpenes triterpenes tetraterpenes they are produced by different plants it is not that the other terpenes are not being produced by those plants but these particular compounds are dominant in those plants so the pathway is dominant and what tells the pathway to be dominated in those specific specific plants that's the channel so the first level of channeling storage tissue to call them the storage tissue where the channeling of the secondary metabolites occur uh, i am not going to specifically tell the experiments uh, individual experiments but i will tell you in general giving some specific example from our lab from our collaborators how the things happens the channeling of metabolites these are the channels the earlier with the water channels if you are a student of agriculture then you can find if water find its own way to pass and go all uh, go, go to the stream all the way so uh, if you consider the, uh, the red line the upper ones they are primary metabolites then the lower ones they are secondary metabolites so this channel is already being demarcated so till the primary metabolites then after that the secondary metabolites so uh, if you see there are storage tissue tissue these are called latex cells latex vessels so alkaloids and all the latex uh, latex producing plants they store their compounds in those latex vessel so these are present either in the flowing tissue or maybe inside the peat tissue so those are being already being determined by the plants and something has something the plant already got the signal that this will be this will be deposited and the sequence of event happens such a way that the channels are formed and the metabolites are being deposited like this the earlier uh, ancient india and ancient mohenjo-daro uh, how, how the storage water storage is being done so the plant already determined that uh, uh, where it, it will be storing its alkaloids likewise uh, in higher plants the tarpin producing plants so those are in specialized tissue so there are different type of specialized glandular trichomes so those glandular trichomes may be may be capitated may be pelted and the other type are called non glandular trichomes or the hairs multicellular hairs so mainly in higher plants the pelted trichomes they are eight cell tissue those are re responsible for synthesizing and storing the metabolites the called terpenes so the plants name i have given and in also the monocots in vetiveria you can see the arrows where those are being deposited uh, those uh, terpenes molecules those essential oils those are being deposited in uh, below the epidermis and in uh, in 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 tagetus it's in specialized uh, vesicles on the leaves we have carried out one experiment in c map we have genotypes which is latex less and which is producing high latex in opium poppy so you analyzed everything and ultimately you found that the anatomy differs the phloem cells that in in the plant which doesn't produce the alkaloids less alkaloids or less latex they are defective means they don't produce latex produce less or don't produce the latex vessels in their in their um, phloem region so uh, after finding out that then we analyze the different cellular degrading enzymes so their cellular degrading enzyme enzymes are not being activated in those plants and this is the uh, this is the level of channeling uh, how, how the channeling occur and is being controlled by plant if you see enter into the cell then this is the menthol menthol biosynthesis menthol biosynthesis starts from geranial pyrophosphate it, it produces limonene which occur in the plastids these two steps then limonene is transported to endoplasmic reticulum then it is being converted to isopiperitonol then isopiperitonol then converted to isopiperitone that that that, 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 that is being in the uh, mitochondria then it comes to the cytoplasm isopiperitonol then isopiperitone to isopulagan pulagan then menthol and menthol neomenthol all these compounds those are being synthesized in the cytoplasm so this is the second level of channeling so the channel occur within how the internal organelles are being coordinated to produce a product in a pathway so that has been determined by the plant 
and which uh, ultimately it is being regulated, which has been not studied right now. So in the plant species, then come to the pathway itself. Then in the pathway, the, this is the third level of channeling. So the molecules are being channeled here. Molecules are being channeled in the pathway in different plants. So if you take the mentha species, different mentha species. So mentha species like mentha gracilis, mentha spicata, mentha longifolia, mentha piperata, mentha arvensis, mentha gent gentilis, pipe, all these uh, uh, citrata, mentha piperata, citrata. So म्यूट कर दिया हो गया Okay, again. Am I audible now? Hello? Yes, you are audible. Okay. So yes, sir, you are audible. the interruption. Sorry for the interruption. I will come to the slide. I think I was here. So this is in different plant. So in different plant, different metabolites are being produced. We tells, I'm audible, okay? Rajiv? Yes, yes sir, we can hear you. Yeah. Slide view, eh? Slide view, eh, na? Yes, sir, it is in yes, slide. Sir. Okay, okay. So uh, all the metabolites are being produced by different plants, but the things remain dormant in some of the plants and some being, uh, being activated in other plants. So what we did, well, we did one experiment uh, where we could, the last step of menthol biosynthesis is like menthol to menthol. That is controlled by menthol dehydrogenase. So this gene is having a bifunctional activity. It produce, uh, uh, it produce uh, uh, a menthol as well as it revert back to menthol. So by analyzing this enzyme, we could find there are three isoforms in mentha papereta and three isoforms in mentha arvensis. So by another Sir, your video is frozen. Sir, your video is stuck.
दो विकेट हेलो सर वी कैन हियर यू आई एम सॉरी देर आर सम मेजर प्रॉब्लम इट्स इज गोइंग ऑन इन द इंटरनेट इट ओके ओके आई विल आई थिंक सो व्हेन यू गो फॉर द डिजाइनर प्लान टू प्रोड्यूस ए प्रोडक्ट इफ यू हैव मेंथा आरबेंसिस इट प्रोड्यूस आइसोमेंथन फ्रॉम पुलेगन इन केस ऑफ मेंथा पाइपरेटा इट प्रोड्यूस मेंथोकुरन फ्रॉम पुलेगन so these two are specific compounds which are produced by due to different species so what we can do we can uh, have menthocurrin uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, oils menthocurrin is not required is not required then can you we divert the flux towards menthan by putting a cross either rnai or editing that particular gene menthocurrin synthesis so it can be done so you can increase the flux towards menthol uh, also you can clone the gene for higher expression in menthorbenzis if you want to produce menthocurrin in menthorbenzis so the, the flux can be diverted towards menthocurrin once you know the channel how they are being uh, how they are being uh, expressed and what regulates their expression in different plants so, coming sorry. to the sesquiterpenes hello sorry to you your video is off video is up Yeah, your presentation. Yeah, yeah I have not knowingly the internet people they suggested me to switch up the video. If okay, okay, okay. Probably my slides and my faces they are not compatible. Okay, 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 sir. You can continue, sir. Please. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, actually, okay, let me uh, carry on. So in the if you see the uh, Olson et al. Olson and co-worker, so they have given this. so in the trichome itself if you go for the different analysis of different genes so there are in the epical cells some of the genes which are very important for the artemisinin in biosynthesis are being expressed but in the stock cell they are not being expressed so some of the cells in the epical region they are highly active for the production of artemisinin so the flux is going to that direction so if you see the again the artemisinin in biosynthetic pathway these are the genes which are expressed in different part of the plant and different uh, amount the variation the concentration of the artemisinin in content vary in different part of the plants again how the compound is being channeled how the carbon is being channeled that is a that is a question to be asked so in artemisia nova when we went for the c4h rnai means yeah. Hold on. Going for slide part. Need it, sir. No. Hello. Anything? That is audible. Audible. You are audible. Slides are not moving. Slides are not moving. Slides. Slides, slides are not moving. Slides yeah. are not. Slides are not. Video is up.
आ रहा है स्लाइड आ रहा है स्लाइड्स देखो आर्टिमिशन इट्स इट्स इन द आर्टिमिशन इन आरएनआई डाउन रेगुलेशन नो सर नो सर इट इज इन द थर्ड थर्ड स्लाइड आई थिंक इट्स थर्ड स्लाइड I think we have some interruption. We will connect you within a short time, within five or five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sasne will join uh, in two three minutes time. Uh, so please wait. Hello. Sir, presentation is visible? Yes. 
It's not visible, no? Yeah, we, we, we can see, but it's not presentation mode. Ah, that, that we will do. That, that we will do. This is on slide number three. Ah, that, that is. Which no, no. slide is that? Which one is number three? This is number three. This one is number three. This one is अभी स्लाइड कौन सा है कोई सा भी नहीं आप I think, uh, sir, you have to share the slides again. Yeah. So now it is 25th slide. Yes, yes. One second, one second. Hmm. Okay, we'll start from here. Yes, sure, sir. Sir, can you please go to the presentation mode? Already gone. It's coming. Yeah, we, we can see the slides, but uh, it is not in the presentation mode. Usko pehle, isko P2T kuch tab share karo. Pehle unshare karo. Pehle isko unshare karo. Yeah, now, now, now it is coming in a presentation mode. Sir, please. So now the slides are moving also? Yes, sir, slides are moving. Please proceed. Okay. 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 Uh, you can downregulate the cinnamic 4 hydroxylase of the phenyl propanoid pathway. That means the cinnamic acid is converted to comaric acid if you go for stopping the gene here uh, so that the uh, uh, accumulation of cinnamic acid will be increasing the benzoic acid, which will be ultimately going towards salicylic acid. And salicylic acid is a elicitor of, for the artemisinin biosynthesis. Means artemisinin biosynthesis, the sesquiterpene pathway is being influenced by the salicylic acid and ultimately artemisinin is increased. So, see one channel, the gene of one channel can also influence the gene of other channel. So, in, by, man, by intervening in the phenyl propanoid pathway, you can also go for intervening in the artemisinin biosynthetic, uh, biosynthesis. So, coming to the triterpene sterol, these are all col uh, uh, our group work as well as the collaboration with Dinesh. So, the ultimately, but we, we could find out here uh, all these publications that tells us that uh, the pathway uh, of udanolide biosynthesis is being major, the major contributor of udanolide is HMGR pathway. So that has been by uh, different experiments, by overexpression in transgenic plant, by, by um, inhibitions, by inhibitors and by RNAi experiments. So ultimately, it goes towards cycloartenol. Chlorosterol production is less in the plant and which increase the camposterol and stigma sterol biosynthesis. Ultimately, these two sterols goes for the udanolide biosynthesis. So these papers tells about that. Again, this is the Dines and uh, our paper, which says that squalene synthase silencing negatively regulated sterol genes leading to reduced phytosterols udanolides. Ultimately, phytosterols uh, on those composterol and stigma sterols, those are being reduced. So, we don't know it is being also reduced. Another experiments, uh, we could find out that the WARKI transcription, not only the structural genes, but also the regulatory genes like WARKI. The WARKI transcription, a specific WARKI transcription factor, WARKI1, which could regulate the, 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 the expression the, the, of, of uh, uh, nitrogen means the nitrogen expression, nitrogen enhances uh, the sterol, uh, 
steroidal biosynthesis increases the steroidal biosynthesis in uh, ultimately udafarin A, which is mediated by uh, WARC1, and through the through the through the uh, jasmonate pathway. So that has been told, and the same gene has been worked upon by Dinesh, uh, who says that it also regulates the triterpenoid udanolide bio uh, udanolide accumulation. Or biotic stress tolerance through modulation of phytosterol and defense pathway. So, udanolide biosynthesis pathway, so this particular channel has been worked out. Now, also we are working on this to find out the details like branch points, uh, branch point pathway like SMT1. We have gone for the RNA of SMT1. Again, we could find out this is in the same pathway, the campesterol and stigma sterols. These are the main compounds which have been increased. Uh, increased uh, if we overexpress and it decreased uh, when we uh, underexpress the SMT1, SMT1. And we are working on SMT2 and we will be coming up with uh, what is happening if we go for SMT2 RNAi, uh, RNAi expression. So coming to the phenyl propanoids, again, there is a gene called C4H gene, C4CL gene. This 4CL gene actually converts cinnamic acid to cinnamyl coenzyme A. The gene already being worked upon by us, uh, Natalia has not told you uh, in, in, in her presentation. Also, this can be termed as CNL, CNL, uh, CNL H, CNL gene. So this gene, uh, there are different isoforms of this gene. There are five isoforms. And one of the isoforms, it can convert cinnamic acid to cinnamyl coenzyme, comaric acid to comaryl coenzyme, Caffeic acid to caffeyl conjame, ferulic acid to ferulic conjame, but it, it 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 is not interfering with synaptic acid to synaptic conjame, and this synaptic conjame is responsible and going for the lignin biosynthesis. So ultimately, this particular gene we could pinpoint that this is this is going for the eugenal biosynthesis for the uh, in in osimum. So this is the. Uh, CNL gene, as I was telling uh, telling about uh, the CNL gene, this occurs in the peroxygen. So the channel of CNL goes towards the one of the one of the isoform goes towards uh, the peroxygen, and all the beta beta oxidation pathway this occur in the peroxygen to produce the scent uh, in flowers that is in petunia. So our uh, our uh, four CL gene in osimum, uh, one of the isoform. Uh, that has been described here in four. Uh, that is the CNL gene. The, uh, we could also in that lab we could also uh, uh, find out that ADT arrogenate dehydrate uh, dehydrate gene. This this particular gene is responsible for production of the phenylalanine in higher plants like petunia. Not PDT that perfinate dehydrate gene. Uh, this is responsible for in the bacteria to produce phenylalanine. But in higher plant, ADT gene is responsible by by going for the RNAi and stopping that gene. We could find the reduction reduction of uh, different compounds, scent compounds in different concentrations, which could be complemented by feeding the particular compound to the flowers, uh, RNAi flowers. So this could have this has been proved. Uh, then coming to the scent, aroma. So we know uh, we know aroma is an important part of our life. So uh, this aroma, uh, the, uh, Linda Buck and Axel, they got the Nobel Prize uh, in 2004 by finding out the receptors, receptors uh, in our body, which can, uh, the, which can uh, the aroma molecules, small molecules can be attached to these receptors and accordingly the signal is being passed onto our brain and we can find out which aroma is good, which aroma is bad. So, so from morning to evening, we go for different aroma and uh, in our Indian life. So is there a, uh, a market? It, uh, there is a market of aroma. As I told about the product, I will tell about the next part. So there is a global market. So we are a UMI country. India is a UMI country. So aroma is a part of our life. So there are small molecules, small molecules like uh, uh, small terpenes, small terpenes, lignans, uh, then uh, phenyl propanoids, flavonoids, the all contributes the uh, flower and uh, aroma. So, if we go for the osimum plant, the tulsi we call it uh, call it holy basil. So, this particular plant contains more than 
300 phenyl propanoids and more than 250, 250 uh, terpenoids. So this is a river, reservoir of different type of phenyl propanoid compound as well as as well as terpenoid compounds. So this is a reservoir of aroma. You find out different, you, you want, if you, you ask for different aroma, this plant can provide. In addition to that, it has got different uh, therapeutic uh, applications. So we could uh, sequence the whole genome, we went for the whole genome sequencing of this plant and try to find out different genes and this uh, for aroma related genes. Uh, and, uh, and this plant is related to uh, Salvia mildurizia and also we could go we could we could we could uh, 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 find out the uh, stress response of this uh, plant to flood drought salinity and cold generally this plant doesn't withstand uh, to the cold atmosphere so what is happening what are the different transcription factors uh, what are the genes those are being expressed we could analyze this so we have a now a reservoir of reservoir of genomic genomic resources so the, with utilizing these genomic resources, we are now going for analyzing different plants. Uh, if you go for the osimum plants analysis, what is the channel? Different variety and different metabolites, those are being produced and related to the transcripts or the genes which are being expressed, overexpressed or underexpressed. So the red color, uh, red color uh, arrows, they indicate which are the, which are the uh, specific pathway operating in those plants uh, in, in 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 different varieties of which are I have earlier shown the different varieties. So these are the compounds those are being produced in those plants. These are the terpene in Kilmendes curriculum mainly the terpene compounds are dominant and these are the genes which are been overexpressed. Then in the plants Americanum Americanum these are the uh, the red color cinnamyl aldehyde and methyl cis uh, cinnamate. This this pathway is dominant and octanyl acetate, this, has been, this, this is being produced in this plant. Gratissimum again, this is the normal pathway. So the red color says that the eugenol is the main, uh, main component in this plant along with osimin and cuminin. Then in basilicum, basilicum methyl eugenol, methyl chavical, methyl chavical is the main component. And also in addition to that, uh, the methyl chavical is being produced in epicardinal, osimin, these are the terpenes which are produced in higher amount in this plant. Then uh, in Basilicum, again, this pathway says that methyl chavical, different variety. This is a but different amount. But how the, I was talking about the channel and how the channel operates. This channel operates, but how, what tells it to produce higher amount in one plant? What produce, what tells it to produce lower amount to, in another plant? It has not been worked out. So in future, we can work out on this. So methyl chavical is the main component in Basilicum. So coming to the, all the Basilicum, they produce methyl chavical. Simsurbi, this produce higher amount of linalool, about 75 percent in, in, in its essential oil, 0.75 percent essential oil. And in uh, Africanum, Simjoti, the mainly cariophyllin, nerol, geranial, these are the compounds which are being produced dominant and phenyl proponent pathway is not dominant. Then there is a bright Bikarsuda and Kusmohak, again methyl chavical. So, uh, in sim IU tenufluorum, the holy vessels, we find that eugenol 83%, the eugenol pathway after that methyl eugenol and methyl chavical pathway, it, uh, they don't operate. So, recently we have a finding which you can report uh, maybe in future that the promoters are defective for methyl methylation, uh, methylation specific activity. So, the promoters, they don't express in the trichomes, they express somewhere else. For that reason, the uh, channeling doesn't happen. To the trichom so there are some differentiation in those plants in respect to the expression of different compounds so which will be worked upon in future then osimum telephrom and sin angna there is a difference between the green variety and the uh, that pink variety that is uh, this is the anthocyanin rich variety there is flavonoid content is less in this plant simangana which is not the green variety but uh, uh, anthocyanin, anthocyanin content is very high Anthocyanin, anthocyanin pathway operate and flavonoid pathway is decreased. Uh, there is decreased expression, but in the green variety, the uh, flavonoid pathway is increased, but uh, the anthocyanin pathway is decreased. So uh, I, I think I should stop here. Uh, uh, these are my students and the group. 
uh, again uh, with this well, uh, we go to the field as dr sanjay was also telling um, with these plants we study variety we develop and we go to the field to the farmers and for this uh, my colleagues like sanjay um, sanjay sodan singh and uh, here dinesh is there uh, he is co collaborator for uh, different aspects of our investigations and also earlier i worked with natalia and these are my students i am thankful to the director to provide me this uh, uh, platform to speak uh, some of the experiments some of the uh, thing uh, which is uh, we, we are working on like channeling and different aspect of channeling thank you very much thank you Thank you very much for the uh, very insightful talk, sir. Uh, so, uh, sir explained uh, in a very simple way how channeling of secondary metabolites uh, are carried out in plants, and also interesting insights into the identification of uh, bifunctional enzymes from uh, menta species. Uh, also, uh, sir gave the insights into ethanolites and uh, biosynthesis in Lithania and how the um, secondary metabolite uh, signature varies in different Ostimum species. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. There may be some questions. Uh, Rajiv, can, can you just check how there may be some questions or... Uh... The question and answer session. No, I don't, I don't think there is a question in question and answer. Okay, let me, uh, uh, Shashni, uh, uh, I want to ask you. Hello. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah a very good presentation. I just wanted to know like uh, there are so many var variants of Wasimum, uh, uh, right? So, uh, like any, how. In your uh, work, any idea like how these are being channeled? Like, uh, is it from the initial precursor itself they get channeled, or in the final steps? Any, um, can you just give some idea about it? Yes, yes. There is. A, uh, I have shown you the channeling, the color change in the last ten slides quickly. So these are yeah, based, yeah. based on the metabolite analysis as well as the transcriptome analysis and expression. Of different genes, how they are occurring in different plants. So I am yeah. talking about now the only the genes which are expressed in the last step, but I don't know which are the transcription factors. So those can be taken up in future. And one thing for sure, recently we came to know that in uh, uh, this experiment uh, is being conducted. That why don't we see the promoters? So what is happening there? So we cloned the GOS genes below the promoters of. Uh, in Osimum sanctum, that is tenuflurium. So okay. when we clone the promoter of uh, three promoter with chavical, methyl chavical, methyl eugenal, as well as eugenal pro genes, promoters. Yeah. So the genome yeah. is available, the promoter we know. So when we clone them and produce the transgenic plant, uh, sorry, infiltrated in the uh, infiltrated, because Osimum transgenic plant is getting, is getting very difficult. So uh, we infiltrated, we could find that in the trichomes very well those are being expressed to which one uh, that eugenal promoters but other promoters they are if you see then they are patchy they are not expressed in the trichomes so something is happening in that plant then we can we, in future we will be studying different species of the plants where what is happening actually uh, the, the pathway oh, okay. is okay. being expressed. yeah okay i think uh, there is one more question uh, from some uh, attendee. How different plants are giving different volatiles? How different plants are giving different volatiles? Again, uh, again, some I, question from this, this question is related to uh, one of my statement earlier. Many plant produces specific metabolites and diverse plant produces diverse metabolites. One specific plant produces diverse metabolites. So a specific terpene is being produced. This is being worked upon by different sheep, sheep genes. And there are many modifying genes like uh, oxidation, ox, ox, undergo oxidation, reduction, hydroxylation. And 
these particular events which occur in a specific plant is being programmed previously. So, uh, as a particular plant is dominant in sesquiterpene, but it may be having the genes for uh, monoterpenes, many more genes of monoterpenes, but a particular sesquiterpene is dominant in that particular plant. So, likewise, so a specific terpene is being produced, this is being modified, this has been worked upon by many genes which have been programmed previously to produce specific metabolites and which is related to ecological evolution, that ecological niche where the plant is growing. So this is a long time a plant is growing in specific region. This acquire, acquire a particular character for modification and a specific metabolite. I think I'm, oh. uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, okay. I'm clear in that. Okay. Uh, you, yeah, yeah. Okay. Rajiv. We can go to next presentation. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sir. Uh, can I tell something about Tulsi? No. With your permission, Dr. Tulsi Ram? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Tulsi Ram, uh, he will be speaking on functional characterization of crucial genes involved in limonoid biosynthesis. Dr. Tulsi Ram is a senior principal scientist at Organic Chemistry Division National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. He owns research. Uh, his own research interest is in chemistry and biology of natural products. His team employs a multidisciplinary approach involving concept of organic chemistry, analytical chemistry, biochemistry, molecular biology, microbiology to address fundamental problems at the interface of chemistry and biology. Currently, his research is involved in studying isoprenoid biosynthetic pathway in plants and he is a very rare chemist who in, 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 in our country who is the interface between biology, actively an inter and, uh, interface between biology and chemistry. And maybe uh, uh, I, can, I can go on speaking about him much more, but uh, I think I'll stop here and listen to his presentation. That will be, uh, be nice of you if you start your presentation, Dr. Tulsira. Thank you. Thank you. My slides are still visible? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ajit, for a, such a wonderful and nice introduction. And indeed, it is a very great uh, opportunity. I should thank uh, Dinesh and uh, Pramod, both of their uh, invitation and uh, pushing me to present here. So they are close friend of mine. And I also thank all the people who are involved in the arranging this uh, symposium. So today, I will, as Ajit uh, mentioned, I will be talking about Uh, mentioned, I will be talking about functional characterization of some of the genes involved in the other directed biosynthesis. Our group, as I just said, both chemistry and uh, biology both runs in parallel. In chemistry side, we start isolating the metabolites and start working on the uh, modification and develop the analytical method for quantification and further in collaboration across uh, India as well as overseas. We give the molecules for biological activity. So this is where in chemistry portion. When it comes to biology portion, we start with a, as usual, as uh, Ajit already mentioned, start with a molecular biology or transcriptome and then study that differential transcriptome analysis, find the genes involved in the biosynthetic pathway of particular compound and clone them, purify the protein, do the uh, biochemistry or enzymology and try to fix them in the heterologous system to produce these molecules in the, using the synthetic Dr. Tulsi, uh, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, could you just come a little forward? Yeah, yeah. We can't hear you like, properly. Yeah. Can you see now? Can you hear now? Yeah, yeah. I think okay. it's clear now. So, already several speakers already mentioned about uh, 
how many about the tarkinards isoprenards and all those things especially arjit mentioned many mono chesquid diterpene and steroidal compounds over 70000 isoprenards are known which involves mono terpene sesquid terpene ma ubiquinones dilicols carotenoids all these involved in one or the other uh, action in the living tissue all these molecules are formed from the fundamental five carbon units that is the isopentenyl diphosphate as well as dimethyl allyl diphosphate its isomer indeed these two you can see that i just showed names i'll show only structures of these intermediates so indeed these molecules are thought to be synthesized through mevalonate pathway which is found in 1956 where three molecules of acetyl coa three molecules of acetyl coa combines at next the hmg coa and which will be reduced to mevalonic acid this is what what we take statins hmg coa reductase inhibitor to reduce our cholesterol where we knock out complete pathway which leads to other problem i will not get into that in eight steps from starting with acetyl coa dmapp is synthesized in the mevalonate pathway so this present in our key plant all those things already ajit previous ajit as well as previous speakers spoken till 1993 or beginning of 90s 90s professor romer found there is a discrimination between the uh, metabolites or pathway when he compared with the feeding experiments where the people used radioactive material and he carried out several experiments and then found that there is another pathway methyl erythritol phosphate pathway which also called non mevalonate pathway or dxt xylulose pathway and so on which presents in the plant plastids and most of the bacteria and green algae in this pathway two molecules that is glyceraldehyde three phosphate and pyruvate join to form a dxt and then further go to dmap and in seven step ipp and dmapp were formed now we have all the genes well characterized and many genes are structurally structure also determined in 70s phosphatidylsin was used as a antibacterial agent which inhibits the dxa so once ipp and dmapp form the both pathway merges at that point further chain elongation leading to germinal diphosphate or pernicyl diphosphate or germinal germinal diphosphate or squalene synthase the reaction more or less form in the same form or mechanistic insight will go in the similar pattern in all living systems so these are the few examples already several people showed this i'll skip this i'll get it to next one so for comfortable we can say that uh, the pathway can be divided into isop one isoprene unit formation next is chain elongation enzyme and third one is the cyclization or terpene synthesis involved in cyclizing the linear chain molecule to form the carbon skeleton of terpene and further cytochrome p450 or tailoring enzymes to decorate the molecule to the final products such as methyl as uh, ajit mentioned or azad directin or artemisin that also he mentioned taxar and so on so forth so in neem we all know that they are used in ages and it is also called the village medicine and it has several properties and many molecules unfortunately it is started uh, the siddiqui started working in 50s all the molecules have been isolated but we don't have library of these molecules whoever want to start first they have to isolate and characterize those molecules and see that whether they got those molecules so these molecules can be divided into basic liminates as in here where c ring is intact and c c co liminates where c ring is open as you can see here so siddiqui is the first one to isolate nimbin from uh, neem and further there were 
150 limonites have been isolated from the mean. So till date, if you say that the isolation and characterization, it took long way of, uh, of other directive. So lay and core workers saw the structure, which was in 68, they put up a partial structure based on 13C in 1975. Uh, they, Nakanishi proposed a structure which is a little bit wrong and that is corrected by lay and co-workers in 1985. And starting from that point till 2007, over 22 years, he completed first total synthesis of other directive. So now what next? We started working on biosynthesis. So this is what lay and co-workers, you need not to worry about the structure. But they got overall yield is 0.00015% in 71 steps and 48 linear steps. Over 35 co workers worked uh, across 22 years. So, what we started since, as I mentioned, the molecules are not available. First thing is we have to isolate these molecules. We started with the cages where uh, CSIR big project was there, synthetic biology project. Many labs are involved, in, even in the uh, uh, three map, several scientists are involved. So we started isolating these molecules and by just a partitioning, we got several molecules in quite good concentration, 80%, 70% concentration uh, um, uh, purity. So these molecules subject, uh, these fractions subjected to column chromatography and purified them. Further, from fruit coat, only two molecules majorly we found, that is azadirone and epoxy azadirodion. Those were purified together. Overall, we purified about 30 molecules by now and started working on how those mass fragmentation we can see in the LCMS or LCHRMS and we established the medium pressure liquid chromatography system for purification in large scale. We can purify in gram scale today. So to show one of the chromatogram, neem oil, you can see that so many molecules are there. So that is what you can see in LCMS. Whereas in UE, very few you can see in the down chromatogram here. So we purified the over 30 molecules, uh, limonites using MPLC and so on and so forth. You can see here we can uh, load almost 2 gram crude extract and run the column. Within uh, 2 hours, 3 hours, we can get the pure compounds. So, this is uh, another with a uh, fruit coat. We loaded uh, by extract about from 1 gram to 10 gram. We purified all the three molecules, azadirone, epoxy azadiradione, and azadiradione in gram scales. You can see those things. So this is the overall chromatogram. Only 60, uh, 16 we can put with a three crude in a one plate. That's what I am shown here. So all these molecules are purified. Now we have 30 molecules in our hand as a library, which are major which are grouped into yellow, that is a basic luminance. The pink one is a medium that searing is open and green ones are final products as a direct in and uh, A, B, C, D and all those things, we call and so forth. So once we have these molecules, we started um, synthetic modification as well as biocatalyst mediated modification for those molecules for changing see that whether biological activity is improved and also given to uh, collaborated with several scientists across India and these are the biological activities you can see that so they show many activities still we have not understood what are the biological activities these molecules show more or less from diabetes to anti cancer, even bone regeneration. Where uh, Dr. Ritu Trivedi, uh, with uh, Ritu Trivedi, we have published uh, two publications 
the both lead generation is caused by the other directing a so next what we started is what is the level of these molecule in the each tissue flowers leaf bark stem and developing stages of neem seeds so we have taken those uh, fruit and then extracted and see that what is the whole limonoid content in that so the weightage and all those things has been given in stage 1 2 3 4 5 here and colors you can see that now so we extracted fruit limonoid and subjected to uplc hrms and see that what is the total content you can see that the stage 4 and stage 5 the major cc coal limonoids are major component whereas in fruit coal the limonoid content is major but the basic limonoids were major in that fruit coal you will see that in a later stage where we do quantification to see that how to quantify we have done the msms fragmentation using the chrms and we have used very uh, normalized collision energy to get the all the fragment from higher to lower mass fragment so for cc columnar the normalized collision energy about 20% is sufficient to get the all uh, higher to lower fragment mass fragment so this is based on that we propose this uh, how this fragmentation occurs in mass that you need not to worry so the for quantification we do that extraction and common uh, chromatograph one example is here the bark extract you can see the total ion chromatogram and the stem extract is uh, down this is stem extract and so many compounds are there when we do that extracted ion chromatogram for example saline we will get the total ion chromatogram uh, extracted ion chromatogram for saline based on that we can quantify how much compound present in that by comparing the standard graph drawn to using the purified saline and for unknown metabolites like if saline is present in any other tissue or any other plant we have developed a library when we do that msms with a 20% mc the msms will be compared with that of library and without beyond doubt we can confirm that this is the molecule and we can quantify all these molecule in all biliary or rutilacy family tree after doing that so tissue specific quantification we have carried out few examples i have given here only one slide as a direct in a that is the final compound in the limonar is mainly present in seed kernel stage 3 stage 4 and stage 5 these are the three things and limbin only found in the stage 5 and stage 4 whereas d acetyl saline found in bark as well as stem the limbin is present in leaves as well as flowers whereas the basic limonoid epoxy azide radian found in the fruit coat of all the five stages however it is mainly present in the first three the levels are high in the first three stages nimocinol was found majorly in the leaf in overall all the limonoids over 60 limonoids we used as a standard and uh, quantified in among the tissues this is what you can see the basic limonoids found mainly in the fruit coat whereas the cc co final products like other direct in a b and saline were found in the seed kernel stage 4 and 5 after doing that to deduce the biosynthetic pathway we have to synthesize the deuterated deuterium labeled or synthetic analogs of these limnas what we have done that we have inserted the deuterium this is what what we have we can uh, synthesize this is a just a cartoon uh, picture and we can subject to msms and see that what are the fragments we get 
For that, we have synthesized this is a guanine uh, molecule derivative. We have synthesized so many molecules and subjected to LC HRMA. To show one example, as I derived uh, the both the hydroxy derivatives as well as deuterium to deuterium insertion. You can see that increase in the molecular and uh, the mass fragmented with a 2 AMA. So with this, if you subject to MSMS, we can clearly put up the fragmentation pattern for these molecules, which helps us in the biosynthetic pathway uh, direction. We can deduce the biosynthetic pathway. So this is what in chemistry portion. In biology portion, we started working on biosynthetic pathway. All the up to FPP, it is a common or squalene or the common uh, step. But however, we need the genes from this plant. And from squalene, oxy uh, epoxidation occurs at 2 3 position to form the S oxidosqualene, which will be cyclized into the dimeryl cation, which can go to eupol or bitterospermal and then leading to bitterylite, which further getting into basic limnite to further move on to limnite. So to get these things, what we started the transcriptome analysis from the various tissue and from the expression levels and differential uh, tissue specific transcriptome, we identified the gene and characterized them for MEP pathway, these are the genes we have found and their expression levels are shown here based on the RPKM value as well as real time also we have done real time PCR work. So this is what expression levels you can see that the reductase, MEP reductase is major in the leaf as well as uh, flower. This pathway is mainly you can see that the violet color which is more or less leaf or green color which is flower. Whereas MVA pathway we can see mainly the HMG coa reductase and all, all the genes which are in blue which tissue is a kernel or pericarp pericarpal fruit coat. So that is the red one. So MVA pathway is major in the pericarp as well as kernel, whereas MEP pathway is in leaves and uh, flower. So based on the transcriptome, we identified several cytotropin cyclases and cytochrome P450 system or 16 cytochrome P450 systems we identified which are highly expressed and which are not present in the other tissues based on the expression uh, differential expression profile we identified them by with the transcriptome we designed the primer and clone those genes this is a common procedure how one will clone i will not get into that once we get the protein purified protein we subject it to in vitro assay whether dmapp or gpp or fpp or uh, square and then extract the assay mixture at the end of the incubation and analyze by GC, GCMS and see that whether whatever we clone is what we thought. So first one we cloned and characterized is a germinal diphosphate synthase. You can see that we co-injected a purified protein incubated with a DMAPP, IPP and extract was co in, uh, uh, treated with the, the assay mixture was treated with alkaline phosphatase to remove the phosphate so that alcohol mixture can be injected in GC and analyze how much germinal it is formed and co-injected with a standard compound and compared with a mass. So this gene, what this uh, 101912 is a germinal diphosphate synthase. Next gene is furnacyl diphosphate synthase. So we found only one furnacyl diphosphate synthase in me, in all tissue. So this transcript to be utilized and designed the primer and as usual clone the gene 
and purify the protein which is about 59 kilo dalton and incubated with the ipp dmpp as well as ipp and gpp and see each of the alkaline phosphatase treated assay mixture was injected analyzed by gc gcms and confirmed with a co injection this is a permicide diphosphate synthase and further the other gene again squalene synthase this is also only one squalene synthase we found in all the tissue so the protein was purified and, and carried out assay using the fpp and analyzed by gc gcms you can see that co injection and it is confirmed it is a squalene synthase along with these three genes and the metabolome tissue specific metabolome we published in the bmc plant biology because i r journal when we submitted they said that not enough data anyway that's it so further we moved on to squalene epoxidases we found three squalene epoxidases in the knee we started with one and to characterize this we try to get the levels of the metabolites but it was a too much messy what we started first we characterize the triterpen cyclase and then come back to squalene epoxidase so we started cloning and characterizing the squalene um, triterpen cyclase there are two five triterpen cyclases we found other than the cycloartenone synthase Uh, out of that, the AITTS1 is a highly expressed in kernel as well as pericarp. We selected that transcriptome and uh, designed the primer and cloned. And after cloning, we inserted into each cell to characterize the metabolite. Then we try to remove the membrane-bound motif. We could not able to do that, so we took to each. and yeast we induced and then the overall the yeast mass was subjected to uh, extraction of these the made a cell soup and then extracted the metabolites and subjected it to gcms we can see that they we had a isolated eupol and tyrocolol from euphorbia species lanisterol we had ergosterol we had beta amirin was isolated from uh, uh, chapa plant so some of the metabolites where we did not get triterpen cyclase uh, triterpen we isolated them some where we can get we got from a commercially available compound and we try to do that uh, metabolite analysis it is matching with the lupial or uh, uh, amirin however when we see the mass fragmentation the product is different than lupial or alpha amino so although the rt value is matching with the alpha uh, uh, alpha amino and uh, lupial what we went ahead we have done large scale and we got uh, about 150 120 mg of crude extract from 60 g of yeast collect subjected to the silver nitrate silica gel column and purified one by one you can see that unknown metabolite so pure metabolite we got and subjected to nmr and other spectroscopic study from the hmbc hsqc which i will not discuss so we deduce the molecule is tyrocolloid 724 diene p beta r then we carried out the structure uh, transcription uh, studies with uh, in collaboration with dinesh so we sent this gene and then we did that so the limonite content was increased when we <coughs> transcribed the leaves neem leaves with these genes so we confirmed that the tyrocolor 724 diene 3 beta all is the intermediate involved in the biosynthesis of limonite meanwhile we patented that uh, work in the indian patent you know how much uh, time it takes by that time my student applied one of the fellow in uh, abroad 
and he presented this data. Of course, we did not get the position, but we got scoop for this. They utilized our transcriptome and our uh, whatever we deposited data in the NCBI. And they finished and published, they can publish in a uh, PNS paper using this data. Because we already said this is the molecule is involved in the biosynthesis of limina. Anyway, so we have patent now and the thesis is uh, submitted much before. So what we have done to characterize this qualine epoxidase, we took this triterpene cyclase along with qualine and transform the yeast cell and extracted the total steroids or luminals from the cell and subjected to GCMS or GC quantification. So without squalene epoxidase and with squalene epoxidase, there is an increase in the level of Tirukala 724 dienol, which indicates that the squalene epoxidase what we inserted is helping the level of these molecules and it is also true with the endogenous metabolites their levels with uninduced and induced the levels were increased as you can see in the graph further to deduce that further after uh, triterpene cyclase what are the other intermediates or genes might be involved. We developed the suspension culture and this is what the chalas as well as the cell suspension extract we injected in HRMS. Further, we fed with a 13C labeled glucose to cell suspension and you can see that the M plus H as well as M plus sodium in a normal un unlabeled glucose where we use and with a labeled glucose where we use, you can see that so many lines. If you expand, the plus one increases. So over 20 days, we fed with that glucose and then finally the saturation, we saw that number of uh, the carbons or 13C labels can be maximum, which was subjected to MSMS. That data was analyzed based on the what deteriorated compounds we uh, analyzed by HRMS that previously. Based on that, you can see that <coughs> the molecules, the 13C labeled molecules out the, of the cell level is increasing <coughs> with a different 1,6-13C labeled glucose in blue, green 1,13C labeled glucose and red one is to 13C label glucose. Based on the fragmentation, we deduce the <coughs> pathway for the biosynthesis of to some extent. So up to basic limits right now. And even we could able to see that Tirukala 724 dying 3 beta also labeled well in this method. So further analysis of that cloning and characterization of genes, downstream genes after triterpene cyclase is in progress. And also we have used mavinolin as well as phosphonomycin as a inhibitor for FBA and MEP pathway. We found that when we treat with mavinolin, the level of limonite is decreased. <coughs> Whereas in phosphonomycin, treated uh, cell culture, we did not see any effect on the levels of limonite. This clearly indicates that the MVA pathway contributes for the biosynthesis of limonites. In summary, we have isolated majority of the limonites and developed the analytical method and the synthetic modification biocatalysis has been carried out to modify those metabolites. And several of them showed various biological activities. Still further, we have to screen with many other biological activities. So, we close 
still write up this activity that is circular 724 diene e beta 1 and show that this is the intermediate involved in the laminar dye synthesis. Feeding experiments at transcriptome analysis we use to identify the, some of the downstream genes. However, the functional characterization is progressing and we try to install these genes up to tritercyl cyclic in a yeast system to functionally characterize the downstream cytochrome P450 system. This is what about the mean. So these are the group members. The work presented today is Saikar Aldar who is a scientist at Nish Jorat and Avinash is a submitted and he is in China in a big group. Karthi last week went to US for a postdoctoral fellow and these two are uh, Sherwani and Payaz are uh, going to submit their thesis soon. So this is the work today what I presented done by these five people. And financial support from CSIR, DBT, ICR, ICMR, and direct rail, CSIR, MCL is highly acknowledged here. Because of that, we could able to do this work. And thank you for all for listening to me. And if any questions are there, I will be happy to answer. I hope the presentation was clear and audible. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shasni sir and uh, Rajiv. Uh, thank yes. You very much. Yes. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tulsiram. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. Can I uh, request uh, uh, Rajiv to uh, summarize? Thank there you, are a few questions. Yeah. Sure, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, sir. It was nice to know the multidisciplinary approach uh, to decipher the limnoid biosynthesis. Uh, thank you, sir. And, sir, we have few questions. Yeah, sure. So, the first question is, uh, is it possible to know the number of genes involved in limnoid pathway by using your transcriptome data? Yeah, over 38 genes are involved, but they, that may not be standard. But what we notice is over 38 genes are involved, starting from acetyl CoA to azadine. Thank you, sir. And the next question is, uh, which part of the tree is having the highest limnoid? Which? Which part of the tree? Ah. Which part, which part of the tree is, is having the highest limnoid? Seed kernel that I already showed that graph. Seed kernel is the tissue which has highest amount of limnoid. Uh, Dr. Tulsi, I have one question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Tulsi, lots of work, uh, gene yeah. identification as well as purification of specific molecules. Yes, uh, what is the status of uh, synthetic biology? in this huh? area for synthetic biology in this area to synthesize these molecules in yeast or in E. coli, any success? Yeah. So that's what uh, Prabhuji, what happened is if I want to characterize downstream genes like bitter lignite, which are not major compounds in any tissue, if you want to have, we don't know what are the biological activities of those molecules. Okay, so if you want to do that, we started genomic integration of triterpene cyclase into yeast and put one of these genes and see that whether we are getting the product to identify. Otherwise, we cannot identify any genes there. Okay. We, are, we have shortlisted 16 cytochrome P450. And two cytochrome P450 reductase, which I did not present. So, those we have to utilize. If you want to characterize them, we have to have the uh, uh, genes, the CRISPR based genes inserted of the yeast system. 
Okay. Okay. Because as I remember that uh, in uh, one of my work, we isolated few cytochromes and we showed very good correlation with the actin biosynthesis. Yeah. So we thought or that transcriptome. Yeah, transcriptome. We thought that uh, those CYPs might be involved in azadirachtin biosynthesis, but we can could not do the functional uh, analysis to show that its involvement. Exactly, so exactly. Whether, whether there is a platform in East or any other system which has been like developed to carry out uh, analysis of uh, uh, this azadirachtin biosynthesis or pneumonite biosynthesis? So, one way we can do that is a transcription studies. Whether any luminosity is increasing, but we don't know the properly functional characterization step by step, still it is very tough. Mm. We have to screen all the 15 step by step right now. Okay. Okay, now. Okay? Yeah, 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 this is okay. I think there is one more question. Yeah. Uh, can we make uh, novel limonoid metabolites by mutating genes? What? Can we make a novel limonoid metabolites by mutating yeah. genes? That only after getting the cytochrome P450 system and utilizing different luminoid skeleton, if they accept or functionalize different functions, then it will become novel. But still, I don't know whether it is, whether they will accept or not. Dr. Tulsi, yes. in this year, uh, a very good talk and a lot of chemistry involved, of course, uh, we all know what is the importance of chemistry to decipher any pathway. So, uh, can you just give an idea like how how many years it would take the take to characterize the entire pathway if everything is like uh, supported in terms of chemistry and biology? <laughs> any idea? Because it's a it's a huge pathway, right? Uh, you said some 35 or 36 steps. Yeah. yeah. That's correct, but what happens in uh, biology, we will not be supported. Like leg and co-workers, 22 years they can keep working and public. Here we lose, if you start, keep, for me already started uh, rebuttals. Hey, what you are doing already seven years over within yeah. the institute as well as outside institute. If you really want to do, yes, support is required. In your question, if I say, if plant physiologist, yeah, okay, and bioinformatics and synthetic biology, if they join together within three to four years, if we dedicate properly, we can complete it the pathway. Okay, yeah, but boy, all the people have to come together. So, yeah. only can, one person can, one lifetime also, it is not possible. So, can we develop a uh, uh, like a platform with the uh, plant physiology persons, chemistry like you, some other persons to make a, a strong proposal and keep working on it? Yes. Anyway, Prabodh is there now, previous previously we cannot ask him, now he can push this project, bring the people together. You see, Ajit, Ajit is doing so many OC1 plants, but several genes he is unable to get in there. So these are all plants can be come together and work people together. What is happening is nowadays they make a group themselves and leave the working people away for funding. That's what now Prabhat can take forward and see that people who are really serious can be pulled together and working. Okay, okay, maybe we will have some uh, brainstorming soon 
and uh, we should try to see that at least in one plant uh, all expertise available in india those who are working scientists can contribute to i think develop at least information about one biosynthetic pathway yeah that's what that's what it is started but people stay away from the because of the complexity they went away it should not happen like that Doctor, tree tree plant. There is tree plant, and this is a very complex molecule. Yes, yes. So it will require time. If uh, but uh, as you told, if you come together, uh, we all come together, then it will be very. Uh, soon Definitely, it, it is easy. You see, when you sub uh, Ajit, you presented that uh, tissue specific localization of the metabolite. Yes. Same thing, limonite. It is the latex. You can see that uh, plant by. Uh, BMC plant biology in uh, our paper 2018, mm. we dissected that where exactly they store that. Yes, yes. So yes, that is what if we come together. If I do learn and do that, it will take years. If we yes. come together, definitely we can achieve. Okay, okay, okay. No more questions. If no more questions. Then, uh, then on behalf of uh, CMAP and the organizing committee, Director CMAP, uh, I extend my uh, thanks, grateful thanks to all the speakers who have spoken in this session. And really, we are grateful to them. And uh, maybe uh, a very good collaboration can be developed in future uh, uh, between like-minded people as well as different expertise. And thanks I, uh, once again. I thank the director CMAP as well as the organizer Dinesh and all organizing committee IT for uh, handling these sessions very nicely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajit and uh, uh, Rajiv for chairing the chairing and co-chairing the session. Uh, before we end this session, we I have an announcement to make here. Uh, all the poster presenters, please uh, uh, upload your. Uh, posters in the Twitter account which we have shared. If not, you can send your uh, posters by today 6 p.m. And uh, uh, yeah, so after 6 p.m. we will not entertain uh, the posters because we will have to uh, keep them for two days tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Yeah, please uh, uh, go ahead and uh, have a break for one hour now. We will rejoin at 2.30.